This is Off Planet Radio. Welcome once again to Off Planet Radio. This is actually Off Planet TV. We're doing video. It's going to be kind of a an exciting time. I've been away from doing interviews uh, for most of January. Gosh, we're into February now, aren't we? And heading into March of 2021, right through the eye of the needle right now, deep into the heart of this thing. So much energy roiling about right now. So much going on. My guest today to my great shame, has not been on this program since actually pretty close to the beginning of Off Planet Radio back in 2011. But um, I followed his work over the years. I followed what he's been doing. And um, through a mutual friend, we kind of reconnected. And because his material deals so much with a lot of the same things that I talk about, I thought it was a great time to reconnect with Matt Presti. I'll just give you a brief thumbnail. Uh, metaphysicist, musician, patriot, philosopher, poet, practitioner of universal law, natural science, and living philosophy. And he is currently the president of the University of Science and Philosophy in Swanona, Virginia, which is the Walter Russell Institute and we will talk a lot about Walter Russell throughout the course of this show. But just to reach out a hand across the land and say hello again, Matt Presti, welcome. Thank you, Randy. Appreciate the invitation. Good to be back on the Off Planet Radio Forum orbit uh, after 10 years. After 10 years. Yeah. Like I said, time goes by fast. That yeah, was actually the real early days of the show, too. So, um, there's so much we can talk about, and we will probably hit a lot of subjects as we go through this first hour, which is the public hour that people will find out on the YouTube land. And then in the second hour as well, we're going to talk a little bit more in depth and a little bit more loosely about some things that I think will go into consciousness and cosmology related to Walter Russell. But here we are now, and when I first spoke to you back in 2011, you were like three years or so into the journey with Walter Russell at that point, as I recall. You had discovered his work in early 2008, I believe. And you came on and really unpacked the whole concept of what Walter Russell was writing about with the secret of light, the, the concepts that I... I remember the one statement that you made and it stuck with me, and I've quoted it and requoted it, and it's that light doesn't travel, it is. Because for me, in that moment, it was an epiphany. It was like when I realized that all of the things that I had my doubts about with the way science was being done were wrong. So give us a little bit of background on your journey from there and where, where you are now, which is a decade later, you you're at the front end of this thing. Yeah, um, talk about a divine journey. I, you know, how does one really say that you're sort of meant to do something, but you just don't know it yet? And I know that uh, my interest for Walter Russell led me to Swananoa. I actually went there to see the, the palace, and I was wanting to see the artwork, too. And I learned that the artwork was not out on display. So that kindled a hope inside of me that, and a desire to actually see it out in the public view again someday. And so one thing led to another, come 2014, I got a phone call from the former president, Michael P. Hudak, and he had said that he's been watching my work for some time and was very impressed with it and kind of slipped the question by me, um, how would you like to be president of this organization someday? And I thought he was kidding at first, you know, it's like, 
Well, um, I don't really have any requirements. I, I've never gone to university, but by 2014, I think I had read every single piece of Russell's work. Just one of those things that some people are drawn to certain <laughs> masters, if you will. So, you know, some people, you know, study everything Nikola Tesla wrote, where others look at, uh, you know, different inventors, philosophers, and, you know, million different interests you can have and mine just happened to be walter russell and his work so um lo and behold i would actually get another call later in 2014 that says uh, from michael i've spoken to the board about you being my replacement and i'll need you to come up to ohio in december and pick up all the uh, file cabinets and things because <laughs> Currently, it was all being run online. There was no physical location since 1998. Uh, the university had closed its physical doors at Swannanoa and moved everything into storage in a warehouse. And when that call came and I ended up starting out in January, January 1st of 2015 as the director of operations with Michael as president for one more year. And then in January 1st of 2016, I assume the role of presidency and that's really when things begin to take off. And, you know, I just must say that a lot of the philosophy and the work of Walter Russell is based on his own divine illuminations. And uh, we can certainly talk more about that, but I had my own mini illumination. Yeah, actually, I, that, I do want to talk about that. Go ahead and go into that because I was reading your blog and you talking about this, this, this illumination People may want to know, too, as well, that um, if you go and look at Walter Russell's history, he actually uses the term cosmic consciousness. This book is, this is um, Cosmic Consciousness by um, Richard Maurice Buck, MD. Mm -hmm. This is actually a cornerstone of my life as well. I first found this book probably in my early 20s, and I've re read it, reread it. It's like on my shelf as a major reference. But this is actually kind of of the era and of that same kind of awakening that Walter Russell had himself and that you're going to tell us about. Go ahead, please. Yeah, just to finish up with the, the story of transitioning, um, the my own little illumination in 2015 led me to a timeline where I named each year from 2015 to 2022. And lo and behold, the, the year of the museum was 2018 and we found a location. And in 2019, the year of rebirth, everything was moved out to the location and set up over a year's time. 50, let's see, 64 tons of art, sculpture and personal effects. I mean, the man was prolific and he and his wow. wife had amassed quite a large amount of stuff. And, uh, of his artwork, there were 40 tons of art and sculpture, and that was all set up in 2019. And here we are in, in 2021, which is the year of science, and hopefully we're going to do a lot there in the coming year to uh, further a lot of the lab work, research, and development that's been taking place behind the scenes. Uh, it's a lengthy, laborious project, but nonetheless, I think great things are going to come from that. And uh, by 2022, uh, I hope to see this university financially stable for all time. And that would be a great thing. And also to, to begin to release, you know, up, updates and advancements in power generation into uh, conscious corporations that can multiply that to a greater degree. So a lot going on behind the scenes here at the university, but at the same time, uh, having come from 2010 to where I'm at now, it's, it's quite an amazing adventure, a journey that has been nothing but one fulfillment after the next. And um, divine illumination is really the core and the foundation of Walter Russell's work. Um, the Universal One, as you know, is his first uh, treatise, his right. first attempt at explaining a science that is given by his own divine illumination. And that book went out to uh, 1,000 recipients, 300 universities, and 700 scientists back in 1926-27. A uh, few answered back. Uh, I think Nikola Tesla was one of the only scientists to answer back and recommend to Walter that he lock that work in a sepulcher for a thousand years because mankind is not unfolded enough to be mm -hmm. able to understand it. 
But uh, ultimately, his divine revelation was the basis of the whole philosophy and the science that is taught at the university still to this day. Uh, we have literally thousands and thousands of orders that go out to over uh, 50 different countries. And especially in the last year, we've picked up quite a lot on sales. So uh, every purchase helps support the University of Science and Philosophy and and preserves the Russell legacy for all posterity. So are these the home studies that Walter Russell originally envisioned when he started the Institute? Well, the Universal One came out in the late 20s. Right. right. And uh, it wouldn't be until, see, in 46, he wrote The Secret of Light. And in 47 and 48, he wrote The Message of the Divine Iliad, Volume 1 and Volume 2. And those were hardcover releases. It wouldn't be until 1950 when he and Leo, after they acquired Swannanoa in 1948 and established the University of Science and Philosophy, uh, its inception date was December 2nd, 48. By 1950, he would complete a 12 unit home study course, which is prolific. I mean, just, just absolutely profound. Yeah. Um, one of the greatest courses I've ever read in terms of helping to unfold the self, the genius within each one of us that academia really fails to address you know so we, we we find that we get a lot of university students who come to the university of science and philosophy to obtain the work of the russells because they feel they didn't really get what they paid for in a typical academic institution you know these kinds of questions who am i why am i here what is my purpose on earth are all answered and they really are answered through your own self and mm -hmm. your ability to begin to create the kind of relationship that cuts out all middlemen with you and the creator. It's, you know, you and the oversoul, if you will, or the, the, right. uh, you know, higher the, self, Holy right. spirit. We use all exactly. those terms. Yeah, exactly. And they're all interchangeable, but exactly. Yeah. So the home study course was the, uh, that's the flagship curriculum for the university. And it's an incredible course and uh, you know if anybody wants to look at the work they can go to philosophy.org forward sl forward slash store philosophy.org forward slash store and, and and get a gander at all the, the different yeah. items we offer and so you guys know all that information is down below of the videos wherever you're seeing them we'll put mm -hmm. all the links up Good deal. um wow what a uh, how interesting philosophy.org points mm -hmm. right to walter russell's work i was real impressed with that yeah what is the um, what is the current status of Swannanoa itself? Swannanoa is in need of repair. It's it's really been neglected. Okay. Um, I'd say if it weren't for our student body volunteering, uh, we have a few students that live on the mountain, on on uh, Afton Mountain there where Swannanoa is located, and they put in hundreds of hours of volunteer work each year to maintain at least cutting the grass and, and some minor repairs and things like that. Um, but since we moved out, it's really been in a state of disrepair since 1998. And there's a lot of uh, state requirements and county requirements that would necessitate large expenditures to be able right. to open to the public. But it is a noted historic site, so they are able to have tours. And if you just research or do a search at any engine for uh, tours, Swannanoa, uh, you should be able to find, hopefully, a schedule. I know they had shut down due to the, due to the COVID this past 2020. Yeah, of course. I so, did. unfortunately, I yeah, I, I think, yeah. Uh, you know, they could have kept tours going up to people, groups of 10, I think it was. But mm -hmm. ultimately, it's it's just one of those things. But hopefully, we'll see that uh, all reopen in the course of the lockdowns switch um, direction is my hope. Well, it's going to require some brave moves on humans who who, who will not, you know, cooperate or, uh, you know, just refuse to participate in any more lockdowns. So we'll see where that all goes. But hopefully, you know, there might be some investment opportunities come along for the owners, the current owners, to be able to do some fix-ups. But at, at right now, I'd say it's looking at millions and millions of dollars of repairs to even be able to get it open as a, as a uh, mm -hmm. habitable dwelling, if you will. There's a lot of, again, county requirements, you know, sewage, septic system, a treatment plant actually is required. 
yeah, by the uh, I would imagine. Wheel open a 52 room mansion. But I'm hoping to see that happen someday. But we're literally, the Russell Museum is five miles away from the door of Swannanoa. So you can actually visit both in a day if you happen to be in that Virginia area, Waynesboro. Nice. And uh, we're down in the valley in Waynesboro in a really great building. And, uh, you know, we're fortunate to have it and be so close still. Yeah, that, that kind of puts things into um, uh, an easy trajectory as a, as a, a visitor point, definitely. Um, your current project is the Walter Russell Museum, as I understand it, to revive and bring back specifically Walter, Walter Russell's artwork, which, again, I understand is rather voluminous. Yeah, that's correct. Um, again, we, we moved with a team of seven people, myself included, 64 tons of art, sculpture, and personal <laughs> effects in nine days back in late, uh, well, I'd say the fall of 2018. And that was one hell of a job. You know, I had no experience in moving artwork to begin with, but ultimately what would have cost a, a quarter million dollars to do, we were able to do for around $2,500 with the, the rental truck included. Nice. And the volunteer staff we had and have since had is just tremendous. Um, we currently have five employees total working at the museum. And uh, that's at 518 West Main Street in downtown Waynesboro, Missouri. Waynesboro, Virginia, excuse Virginia. me. Yeah. I'm in Missouri currently. You're in but, Missouri. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, so a lot of travel. I spent eight months in Virginia in 2019 decorating the museum. And, you know, really the, the, the fine arts, Walter represented each one of them. Um, he was a master of each. So we had different sections, which we had to set up, but it just really went together well. It was like a just kind of directing water, which seeks to flow downhill mm -hmm. toward mm -hmm. equilibrium. And every effort we made just seemed to step to the next. And we were able to create a really great museum presentation. And uh, the proof of that, again, I, I have no, no experience in, in uh, curation whatsoever, but three different museum curators who went to college for museum curation came in and commented that the decoration was perfect. Wow. So that, that was a great compliment. And it's, it's just back, harkens back to the message of, you know, Walter and Leo Russell that it really, it sums down to anything you desire to do, you can do if you put your mind to it and work knowingly with that creative force that is in you. And that same creative force, call it the conscience, call it the, uh, the oversoul, whatever you wish to call it, God, the creator, the mind, you know, all these terms are synonymous. When you work knowingly with that force, which is internal, not external, that's how you produce great work on the earth. And uh, I think that's a lesson we can all learn from because the opposite expression of that is the outward seeking of power, which always ends in, dis in one disaster after another. As yeah, we're externalization, I call it, the externalization yeah. of source, mm -hmm. which Walter yeah. Russell basically broke out that he did not view creator God as an anthropomorphized version of a deity, but more as source in terms of the emanation of light, specifically the creative impulse, the creative energy. And, you know, it's funny because I, I was kind of meditating on some of this. I had put out a post last weekend that was actually a podcast which is part of my uh, Eye of the Needle series. And one of the statements in that, these are, I, re, I don't like calling them channeled messages, but they are inspired messages in the sense that they don't come from me so much as they come from what I receive in terms of understanding and insight. And in that commentary, we noted that... Um, Basically, human, humanity today is dealing with gods of forces, of the forces of engines, of nuclear weapons, um, almost everything we do, super, you know, super colliders. All of these things are man's understanding of a mechanistic system that 
is strictly from the standpoint of effect and not cause. And the statement that I made in this message was that the science we presently have is not the true science of God. God creates from the still point. And as I was meditating about that, I was also thinking about the fact that we were going to do this show and how that kind of filters into Walter Russell's teachings about, you know, emanation of light and this concept that we have of matter and specifically how we view the world as a materially manifested mechanistic system, um, what I call the gods of forces, where we're basically smashing things together, colliding things, creating deadly nuclear weapons, um, nuclear power plants. In other words, man still is at the place where we are substituting effect for cause. We don't really understand primary force. And so in, in line with that, you know, and I want to hear a little bit more about your enlightenment. Maybe you can address this because we're at a critical point right now in everything. Our socioeconomic structures, our social systems, I mean, everything that we've evidenced that's occurred in 2020, including the so-called pandemic, are indications of humanity either failing or being at the trigger point where we can begin to move out of the trajectory we're in now, which is self-destruction. Yeah, that's well said. You know, the, the mechanistic mind of man has basically reduced the entire universal construct to that of a machine. And it's unfortunate. And that's the end result of materialist philosophy. And one of the things that is unfortunate for science is that they don't acknowledge philosophy as the very root of their entire, uh, their entire effort, their entire curriculum is stems from a philosophic view of the universe as one of pure materialism. It's the doctrine of materialism. Uh, in Russell's science, he has two sides of the wave of creation. There is the life-giving side, which could be likened to inhalation. And then there's the death half of the wave, which is likened to exhalation. And the senses only respond to exhalation. And so there's your matter universe. Um, if the creator did not inhale space, which is basically the air around systems, the, mm -hmm. you know, the, uh, the blank space or, or the space around all bodies, you know, if you and I were, were crammed right next to each other, we wouldn't be able to really communicate. So there's always space between bodies, which allows for expression and the inner that's interesting. The inner force, if you will, is that which is not noticed by the senses. So Russell often connotes the difference between knowing versus sensing. And in philosophy, idealism, multiple other uh, avenues of philosophy are all based on mental operations. You can't really have philosophy without mental operation. And so in idealism and other branches of philosophy, you have cause is being mental you know and that's really the inward or the life-giving half of the wave the inward uh, compressive side of the wave of creation it, it could also liken to desire desire to say build a or let's just say draw a circle on a piece of paper you know if you don't have that desire there will be no end result of a circle on a piece of paper mm -hmm. but in a scientific materialistic uh, breakdown, the circle can be explained by examining the ink on the paper. So they completely leave the mental universe at the gate, at the door, and don't invite anything mental into the explanation uh, of the mechanistic machine-like universal uh, uh, model that they've adopted. Again, it's the doctrine of pure materialistic externalism. Everything's, you know, smashing, uh, blowing things up to create energy. Uh, nothing in nature 
accepting a volcano perhaps, you know, but of course the volcano only erupts after a certain amount of compressive force is accumulated mm -hmm. in that, you know, magma underneath the volcano and then the eruption happens. But we, we, you know, and I'm not bashing all of science either. I'm just saying that there's, there's pure material uh, doctrines out there that are pretty much running the schools of thought, the think tanks, the chairs of science. And it's trying to explain the whole universe again, like it's a machine with nuts and bolts and, and gears and wires. And, you know, we're completely leaving the mental idealistic side of philosophy at, at the door again trying to explain the universe in a way that makes sense to us like a machine would. And so it's easy to get lost in the senses. The senses only respond to motion and explosion. Um, they don't respond to compression necessarily because it's one of the invisible forces that we can't see. Uh, I'll say there's one force, electricity, and it does two things. It compresses and then expands or it uh, has an implosion and then an explosion. But ultimately, knowing both sides of the wave of creation, the life and the death half, the in-breath and the out-breath, is really the holistic, um, sage-like, mystic view of creation. It's not just half of the equation trying to explain the unknown, which is more materialistic jargon. You know, like quantum physicists sort of are on, on I'd say, sort of the right track, but where Russell would break with them is that they... They think energy comes in packets, like little mm -hmm. salt packets or something, or pepper packets, you know, and that nothing could be further from the truth. Russell called that a travesty of nature. You know, you, you have a condition of stillness from which things divide to compress and expand simultaneously. So once you divide a still point, like if you're standing at attention, in order to walk, you have to divide that stillness of your own body by stepping forward. And once you step forward, it creates the next cycle of expression, which is the opposite side of your body stepping forward. So in that, knowing that at stillness, at standing at attention, or before you press a note on the keyboard, or before you play mm -hmm. a chord on the guitar, mm -hmm. you know, you have to divide that stillness in order to create a sound effect, right? So again, sound effects are not the cause of matter, like in cymatics, they certainly say that sound is causal in some schools of cymatics, but ultimately light is mind and light is causal. And it's the one thing that science can't detect with its senses. So it's trying to find this particle called the God particle, yeah, yeah. which they will never find because the God particle is plentiful in the universe. It's called carbon. Carbon is the ultimate expression of the creator. It's perfect balance between male and female in the wave, uh, the life and death half of the wave at full maturity and full balance. And it's expressed pretty much, you know, throughout the entire universe. I think there's uh, ten, over 10,000 known chemical bonds with different carbon elements. It's the most plentiful element in the universe. And that is the true God particle. And I think they need to really look toward uh seeing why this is perhaps they should read new concept of the universe by Walter Russell, which would help them to understand. And um, I hope that kind of answers a little bit of what you're saying, but yeah, it does. Um, it opens up a whole lot more, of course. And one of them is that, you know, even from his earliest publications, Walter Russell distributed his information and he distributed to academia, targeting them while at the same time noting, how in the 20th century we had removed what we call God, what we call creative creator or source from science itself. At the time that Walter Russell was writing and working, he was really in the heart of this beast of humanism, which was fomenting around the scientific, the scientific backwash of Darwin, really because Darwin spinning off eugenics and then eugenics obviously displacing God by, by empiricism and hard visible proof so that 
when we remove creator, when we removed inspiration really from science, I mean, if you go back and you look at early philosophers who were really scientists as well, Plato, Socrates, Euclid, and then even forward, I mean, even Newton himself was a philosopher and a theologian as well. Uh, however flawed the principles those men science were founded on they had not removed the creator from the equation yet but by the time we turn the corner into the 20th century we're into the heart of what is becoming extremely humanistic science which removes everything that cannot be proved everything that cannot be touched felt seen in a microscope or a telescope we're dealing with really tiny little particles which eventually were were subatomic we're down to quarks we're into string theory um, we're looking at the universe through lenses and speculating about all manner of things in the universe, looking at light through a dark silhouette and not realizing what we're seeing. It, it really is kind of a, a perfect storm of displacement. Do I still have you? There you are. It's definitely a displacement storm. <laughs> Yeah, uh, as Walter said, that the effects of motion are multitudinous, and it's like a kaleidoscope; they're infinite. So you turn the kaleidoscope a few degrees, and suddenly the entire picture completely changes. And that's kind of how the gluons, quarks, and and uh, God particles, and and so on that they're searching for and trying to understand. Gluons, um, I love gluons. We'll yeah, just glue them on here. And, yeah, and exactly. Look at that; it exists. Right, yeah. and and so again, it, it really comes down to a fundamental flaw in, in their denial of philosophy as the root of science itself. Again, they they believe in a philosophic uh, model of materialism, and the philosophy is really the mental side of, of science, which is physical. And they've completely disregarded the mental forces for which this universe is governed and created. In fact, their very view itself is a mental one. The doctrine of materialism is a mental doctrine because if they did not believe in it and they did not adhere to its mental tenets, then there could not be the measurement systems. There could not be the things of which they use to try to prove a physical universe over a mental one. So the very act of believing in or utilizing a materialist philosophy proves nonetheless that they're taking a mental construct and employing it in a physical universe. Because in order to weigh something, someone had to create the scale. But the scale did not just appear because of a big bang that created the scale. The scale appeared because the mind of the person who yeah. created the scale yeah. thought of it in, and then they had to design and use their desire to design the actual physical body to represent the scale in their mind and maybe even do some, some work as they unfolded it. But all man-made creations, and, and if you want any proof if people out there, you know, scientists and otherwise need proof that this is a mental universe and matter is caused by a mental process, then look, then let me offer up the trillions of man-made uh, devices, machines, and inventions as evidence. There, there's my evidence. So you pick anything. Let's how about this pen? Okay. This pen was, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. first an idea in the mind of a human being. Uh, when they build the body for it through their desire, the mental process takes on that body through the work of the hands and that is able to produce as close to what they saw in their mind as possible. And the same can be said for a symphony, uh, a painting, a sculpting, uh, a computer program, a video game, any, anything that we have created in terms of a body, which can be traded, bought, sold, auctioned, so on, acquired in the physical sense, is first, you know, again, the thought in the mind of a human being. And, and that's where they really lose it because they're as that's what the creator is, the mental process, the mind, you know, Walter Russell said, mind is God. And the cardinal error of science was removing mind or the creator from creation. In other words, the poem must have a source, but it cannot be the mind of the poet. 
you know, the painter, you know, we can, we can analyze the paint on the Mona Lisa, but we'll never find the soul of Da Vinci in a, right. in a right. piece of exactly. paint from the, you know, the Mona Lisa. And, you know, the, the symphony, there, there's got to be a cause to Mozart's, you know, uh, symphony in minor whatever. <laughs> yeah. But let's look at a note and try to find the cause of the symphony in the note as opposed to the, the, the composer of the symphony. And again, what is the composer? What is the poet? What is the painter? What is the philosopher? But a, a mental process, you know, and that mental process cannot complete itself or create itself unless it's using both sides of the wave of creation. The life half of the wave really is the mental half. And then the physical half is the death half. Because once you build a body, decay is ultimately what is going to happen to that body. Even the pyramids in another so many years will be gone from the earth. You know, as time weathers on and, and the long march of time, which is just motion, the measure of motion, really, it's not a force unto itself. Right. Um, ultimately, you know, bodies live and die, but what does not live and die is idea. And man is an idea. And mind itself is the cause of idea. So mind and God and creator are timeless and eternal. And that's really, again, mirroring many of the different sages and mystics of time immemorial uh, Emerald Tablets of Toth, Hermes, the, the great Hermetic teachings, you know, even down through some Masonic teachings. Uh, but that wisdom is really the, the time immemorial teaching that man really is mind. And if you have the knowledge of the cause of all things in the universe, then you know, too, that you are also cause, that your soul literally can cause bodies to appear. And I don't mean accidentally, like in, you know, some unwanted pregnancy or something, but sometimes, you know, people do create things that are troublesome or, or sure, accidental regrettable. creations. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I've, I've talked about this, about, you know, the fact that once you create something, you kind of own it and you have a responsibility for it, good, bad or indifferent. And it's kind of the, almost like the Frankenstein monster of the mental plane is that uh, we do create things and we create things accidentally and we create things by default you know my argument has been largely that most of humanity is willfully ignorant because they operate in default mode they do not probe beyond the given scenario that that they're presented which is reductionism you know and i look at science and especially right now in the science behind this so-called um, pandemic, I hate to talk about this, but it dominates everything now and it's so huge. But our medicine is based on people who have dissected dead things to attempt to understand the living. It's chemically based, pharmaceutically based. It's again, this quantized system. And most people do not have a holistic sense of their own biology, their own healing, where energy comes from, the power of breath to heal things. I mean, hey, I got my own issues. I'm dealing with it on a daily basis myself, of deploying natural things, of using breath, of using um, the botanicals and the vitamins and the things that the earth gives us to heal, rather than this um, science of poison called pharmacology. But it is all of this same science that is the projection onto the human collective right now in this fear of death, which is really what underscores all of this. Maybe you can talk about that a little bit from the Russellian standpoint, because I think Walter Russell kind of addressed this about sure. death and what it really is. Right. And so we're treating symptoms not causes exactly and yeah 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 and, and we also do that mentally in a lot of psychology mm -hmm. uh, uh psychiatry i should say psychology is really a bridge to um a greater understanding of man and his mind because psyche means mind and ology the study of so that's that's a, a very pertinent subject and should be a vocational i would recommend people make that a vocational 
uh, pursuit, learning mm -hmm. how to study one's own mind is essential to navigating the insanity of the collective that we're in. Yeah. And it's really, um, as you said, it's the worship of the death half of the wave. I mean, what is a virus to an organism, but something that is there to kill it? You know, we, we've never heard of viruses that are good for the body, but there are actually viruses that are. Um, you would think that every single thing to do with COVID is, a, you know, a, uh, a risk to your life and to your health. And the fear machine has just been pumped into full overdrive. And I think we're kind of at a crossroads for humanity. Yeah, we are. Uh, those who consent to the path of the Great Reset are helping to basically enslave this race forever. Yeah. You, you won't come out of it. And there's another, uh, I would say the great awakening group, if you will call it that, that are refusing to consent. And that is really the only path forward that I can see. Uh, we, we really are at a, call it a nexus moment where That's we have exactly. literally yeah. two courses, two paths that we can choose. And that window is going to eventually close, and then those paths are going to become solidified for whoever chooses to walk down them. Um, the line in the sand is right now, you know, and I think that uh, those who consent to be ruled by tyranny will suffer that choice, and those who, cons who do not consent, uh, in other words, learn to say no. The word no is a very, probably the most powerful word yes. in the English language, in any language right now because it's the only thing that stands between you and tyranny at this time. So I've had several research buddies that I've known for years and uh, we all get together here and there and you know, once a week with a couple in particular, uh, my good friend, Mike Hagan and, and John Sheliak, and uh -huh. we have a chat and you know, for all our research and all the things we've done, the books we've read, the shows we've listened to, you know, you're talking over a hundred thousand hours of research of the three of us put together, none of us really know what the hell's going on right now. I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of, like I said, a, it's a nexus moment that it's kind of like, as if, if time was to slow down where a second seemed to last a year, you know, I like to say we're in the 14th month of 2020 right now, but um, exactly. So yeah. it's just one of those things. I think again, Walter, you liken his dynamics of the wave of creation you know, the death half of the wave is the death of economies, the death of civilization, the death by climate change, nine years left to live, according to John Kerry, uh, death, according to uh, what's the 13 year old girl's name, who's well, actually Greta 18, Thunberg. yeah, Greta, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> who gets her talking points from, I guess, Twitter corporate. Yep. Anyways, that, that's all, you know, going to the side of death. This whole paradigm for 6,000 years, these people have worshipped death. Their gods are gods of death. Their gods are worldly. They worship physicality, you know, the orgies and the orgiastic behavior, mm -hmm. pharma, the cults. You know, there are no cults in nature, I like to say. But in mankind, you'll find plenty of them. And that's why I like to say the Russell teachings are cult proof, is because they, they remove the middlemen out of your life and put the sole responsibility of your life and your unfoldment of your life and desires upon you and the creator within you, which is also known, AKA the consciousness or the conscience as Jiminy Cricket in that great cartoon. If you remember, yeah. said, always let your conscience be your guide. Yeah, right. Yep. And how few of us do that these days, but more and more are awakening to a lot of the truths that are eternal and timeless and self empowering. It builds self-esteem. It creates goals, even long-term ones. Like I said, in 2008, and you know, I discovered Walter Russell in 2010. I visited Swan and Noah. I desired to see the artwork. And then literally 11 years to the day that I began reading The Secret of Light, I opened the Russell Museum. You know, So one desire took 11 years to unfold. So the mind of a the mind of a person who is with intent, time is meaningless. You know, goals are meant to be achieved. It doesn't matter how much time they take. I think a lot of the things that we don't realize too is how to, you know, set goals for ourselves. But 
ultimately, uh, you know, 60 to 80,000 thoughts enter the human brain in a day. Which one are you going to hold? You know, and that's what geniuses are able to do. That's what the home study course uh, will teach you as it taught me to be able to hold a thought, write it down, revisit it, come back to it again and again and again, and keep adding layers of desire onto it until the body begins to form. And once the body begins to form, you know, if you want to change something, step away, revisit it like a painting. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Painting is many layers, a song. Uh, I've written many, you know, hundreds of songs and, and I would, you know, record four, eight hours and then I'd come back the next day and lay another track or two. So you're always layering thought upon thought and that's what creates body. Body is really a collection of frozen thoughts and all bodies we create. Your, your body, the off-planet radio, is a creation of your mind. Yeah, you know, and if you don't is. do interviews right. and get these interviews out to the world and record them, in a body called an MP3 or an, an MP4, it wouldn't exist. So you're yeah. doing the very process as many of us are. And we just, you know, many don't know it, but that's it's the beauty it, of it. It begins with a thought. There's a germ. There's a focus. Exactly. You know, and you just said that, you know, all these thoughts that go through our head in a day. And it was P.D. Ospensky back early in the 20th century that said most of those thoughts are not your thoughts anyway. They're random. They're, they're shooting through. They're just waves that are going going by and how you have to really what i what i talk about a lot is the collapse going down to zero point because that's what i understand from my own meditative practices from my own insights i guess enlightenment is that it is from that still point that we find the nexus to rise up with some focus and our culture doesn't our culture does everything it can to eliminate it by throwing all kinds of things at us i mean we're we're running we're running at very high speeds in terms of um what computers and code and all of the telecom cell phone digital array is doing to us and triggering neural synaptic responses in the brain that are artificial created by this same science which wants to give us 5 and 6G to blast us whereas we know there's humane technology and you're a practitioner of humane technology I, I hope I am as well being responsible and understanding that there's a gift of technology and then there's the overstepping which is where we're at now with the mind control that's being pumped through media and COVID was the perfect arc for all of this because that fear frequency acted as a subcarrier for all of this other crap that they're now unleashing, which includes what they're calling the great reset. Um, the strife of politics right now. I mean, what's gone on. I, I heard your, um, your, your, your interview with David Whitehead, which you did back in July. Maybe we'll just go there for a few minutes um, of how we are being primed in this country for the, how did you term that? The, the next uh, was revolution, a color, like color revolution. Yeah, it's a, it's a cultural revolution 2.0 right. based yeah. on Mao's, you know. But since that time, what we've seen is we saw an election that was factuous, at best dubious, and then the so-called insurrection that occurred on December 6th, the second impeachment of Donald Trump. And look, I, I, I don't judge the political spectrum. I'm not a political creature, but I watched this thing play out for the four years of Donald Trump's term. He was assassinated by the media from day one. And he continues to be assassinated by the media now. I think you have to look at that and go, There's, there must be something here. It's maybe something they fear in the message that he's put out, but certainly in the response that the people themselves have mirrored is something profound. And it's like what you were talking about a few minutes ago, we're on this dividing line and it's on every scale 
but it does appear that there are people who are perfectly willing to walk into the global socialistic nightmare of the Great Reset, while there are other people who just simply are going to say, no, hell no, and I think diverge. I think we're looking at divergence. Yeah, that's well said. Um, I think from a psychological angle, and, and Michael Tessarian over at unslave.com said this very well, that Trump, in a large degree, from a psychological standpoint, represented the hero archetype. Mm -hmm. And because civilization, the past hundred years, but especially in the last 40 years, has become overly feminized, the, mm -hmm. the very idea of a male archetype is despised, hated, and should be destroyed at all costs, you know, and that's really, again, people that don't understand psychology will, will need to take a look at this, but it's a Jungian ar archetype, uh, Freud even to a degree, and, and others who, who had uh, pointed out that, you know, there's characteristics, even, even go back as far as ancient Greece and the 12 gods are really archetypes of a human personality. You know, we're all capable of being gods of war, gods of love. You know, these are all archetypal, even to the point where the sky charts themselves, the 12 astrological signs, you know, count of Fucus is 13th. But nonetheless, uh, the psychological makeup of humanity as a whole is anti-hero. So when a hero appears, it goes against the program. You know, you're not allowed to introduce the hero archetype anywhere in, in civilization. So what did they do? They, they simply attacked using their code words, racism, homophobe, racist, homophobe, xenophobe, you know, in the nine yards, they threw the entire kitchen sink at this hero archetype because he was doing things. You know, I'm not necessarily a Trump supporter. I would say Trump was a Matt Presti supporter. Uh, he supported my views, you know, I like which that. I had long before yeah. I ever heard of him. So I was not for the, P, you know, the TPP. I was not for Paris Climate Accord. I was not for net neutrality. I was against anything that limits human freedom and limits human potential or attempts yeah. to put clamps on natural human progression. I'm a true progressive, not a fake one. You know, I don't want to exactly. progress backward exactly. to the blackness of the jungle. I want to progress to the light of the mountaintop and the absolute full-on free expression of human potential. You know, I'd like to see us, you know, have the ability to, you know, travel through the stars one day in my yeah. lifetime. Yeah. And, and really, that's kind of what Trump represented in a lot of ways from an archetypal point of view. He's that male hero figure. And because of the ultra feminized left, which, you know, despises the male, especially white males, <laughs> yeah, you know, no, this, it, this is an it's entire an imbalance. It's a complete imbalance of everything. Correct. And this goes and, into what Walter and Lau Russell really idealized in, you know, the later works that they did. Exactly. Together. And certainly what Lau Russell put out in some of her later writings about romantic love is that everything is a bell and everything's a pivot point and the masculine and the feminine energies move together they balance each other right and now we're unbalanced and, and this is not to say that feminism wasn't valid at a certain point that's not to say that the liberation of people in any group wasn't valid it's to say that now we've gone completely over on the other side and it's it's a collapse because you cannot destabilize the male or the female archetype to the detriment of humanity, we simply lose balance and we collapse, which is kind of where we're right. at right now. And if you can find any wave in nature to only one expression of either male or female, um, there's different ways to view the wave of creation, how it works in Russell science. For instance, in his earlier works, he equated the compressive force to being masculine and the expressive or mm -hmm. explosive force to being feminine. So life was male and death was female in his early works. But later with his revisions to his own science, which occurred over a 40 plus year period, he, he came to find that uh, both male and female are compressive and expansive. 
So pairs of opposites as opposed to a pair of one being in and one being out. But in other words, say your left side of your hemisphere of your body is male and your right side's female, you know, the, the analytic and the creative, your left nostril is not negative and your right positive. It's two positive efforts, breathe in through the sinuses and then exhale mm -hmm. one exhalation through the mouth. So the two literally become one. So inhalation is always two, exhalation is always one. And that's how they, they reformulated it based on how bodies and nature work. And so nonetheless, it's, it's indicative of the fact that, you know, anything too much is out of balance. So Leo would say, you know, a, a world run by nothing but women would be a disaster. And she wrote that and God will work with you, but not for you. And on the, on the contrary, a, a completely male dominated world would be just as much of a disaster. So you have to have that balance, just like in a home, when a man and woman or husband and wife manage the home co-equally working together as one, you achieve eight times the power by the cube, multiply the cube uh, by the cube ratio of power that you would normally have working alone. So again, if you have an unbalanced home where one person's working toward this goal and another's working toward this one, and there's friction between them and unbalance and an imbalance, then your home is going to be chaos. Yeah. So really that's what we're seeing on a, on a great, on a world level is the imbalance, the unbalance of all the pairs of opposites, which are male and female. And I think on a psychological level, the, the powers that never were, uh, they, they like to utilize okay. this play, you know, to their, their own effects and gains. They know that by imbalancing the home, which is the very starting place of every human unit is in the home itself. Mm -hmm. If you can unbalance the home, if you can confuse the children as to what even gender they are, just think of the confusion that's going to multiply out of the confusion in the very home of the children that you're raising when they can't even identify with their own biology. And this is, they're targeting the, again, the family unit is the strong unit of nature. It's, it's the original unit of, of the human race. And so if you kill that and destroy that, anything built out of that from the home is ultimately yeah. going to be out of balance from the get go. And I think that's to your credit, you notice that, you know, to have that balance, you have to have that, interchange between male and female, uh, which electricity itself is also male and female, you know, and uh, if you were to remove the feminine from the electrical, you know, wave, there would be no creation. Exactly. If you, if you remove the red light from your garden and only allow the blue light in, your garden would die and vice versa. So it takes an equal amount of the, the entire spectrum of light from the red and blue and the white in between to you know, manifest a, a balanced reality. Well, we're kind of winding down the first hour, which I knew was going to go fast, and I knew we'd hopefully pack as much into it as possible. Um, I want to give you a few minutes to actually let people know a little bit more about whatever it is you're doing right now that you want to put out there and to give information out as well, because... You're a busy guy. I mean, you've got music, you've got video work, uh, you've got all kinds of projects going on in addition to the work that you're doing uh, with um, the Walter Russell Institute. Um, so tell us a little bit more about how they can find you and avail themselves. Sure. Well, you know, there's just tremendous work, uh, teachings offered by the Russells. They're one of many people, one of many, many couples and you know, great men, great women, giants whose shoulders we stand upon. And um, to acquire their works, uh, visit philosophy.org forward slash store. And uh, I'll create a code just for the folks in your audience. How about off planet 20? Perfect. All, all caps off planet 20. And you'll save 20% on your order for one week. We'll, we'll put an end date of, uh, I don't know when you're going to launch the show, but I'll make it one week. After It'll be about launch. a week. So uh, okay. however you want to do that. That'd be great. So off planet 20, that code will be active for one week after your show goes live and cool. your listeners will save 20% on, 
on uh, books and booklets. And for me personally, you can reach me at mattpresti.com, M-A-T-T-P-R-E-S-T-I.com. I uh, recently updated my website, first time in 10 years since I've, <laughs> you know, done a new format. You know, things tend to go in decades with us, Randy. They do tend to, yeah. It's a good yeah. thing. But uh, other than that, all my social media is down in the footer of the website. Any page on the website, mattpresti.com, will get you to social media. Um, I've kind of backed out of Facebook. I'm just done with the, I don't want to be any part of a censored platform. So I'm trying to, you know, see what other sites do as far as like Telegram, Gab and, and Parler and things yeah, like that. I'm on Telegram. I'm Are using you? that largely as a backup. Um, yeah. And I'm actually, you know, I'm starting to like it because it's, it's sort of uh, a little more impersonal. You don't have to create a comment bot room if you don't want comments you can just kind of share your thoughts and it's well, it sort of relieves the pressure of always having to check for social media social media has become pressure social media it has become something that's sucking you back into these devices mm -hmm. and we want to be responsible about using these devices and we can use them humanely or we can continue to chain ourselves to the machine that wants to turn us into binary units inside of a simulacrum. And I don't want that. And I know you don't either. Right. All right, my friend, good stuff. That's going to wrap it for this hour. Uh, we will turn the corner for the patrons and for the rest of you. Um, thanks for joining us. The truth is out there. It's inside of you. Just like I always say, see you the next time. This is Off Planet Radio.